Dota 2 is a complex game. Browse the internet and you will be bombarded with tutorials on how to learn all of its intricacies. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to one simple solution. Damage. You have to deal enough damage to kill your opponents, and no hero deals more damage than Phantom Assassin. Her exceptional critical strikes can land for multiple thousands, annihilating even the tankiest heroes in a single attack. Nothing can withstand the full power of a late game Phantom Assassin. At least, that's how the story goes. But is this true, or have the legends been embellished? Today, we explore the history of one of Dota 2's most classic assassins, and we will see how she performed at our most important tournament series, the International. So, how good was Mortred, the Phantom Assassin? The story of Phantom Assassin is sponsored and brought to you by Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail won Best Mobile Game at the Game Awards, but it's also available on PC and PlayStation and it supports cross-platform play and data sync between all three clients. The game just released Update 1.6, which offers exciting new maps, events and two new 5-star characters. Ruan Mei is an elegant biologist centered around buffing her allies by increasing their break efficiency and speed. She is an ice-type support that follows the path of harmony. And then we have Dr. Ratio, a curious name for an equally curious character. Dr. Ratio is all about propagating knowledge, although that may sometimes come with a few words that are well considered, but harsh. Honkai Star Rail 1.6 will also see the return of the popular Stellaron hunters Blade and Kafka. Very importantly, if you log into Honkai Star Rail on the 17th of January, you can receive one free copy of Dr. Ratio. This is the first time that Honkai is giving away a limited 5-star character, so make sure you log in on that date, January 17th. Check out Honkai Star Rail at the link down in the description. There's also code down there that you can use to redeem 50 Stellar Jade. Thank you again to Honkai Star Rail for sponsoring this video, and I hope you enjoy the story of Phantom Assassin. Phantom Assassin was implemented into Dota 2 on the 11th of June 2012, shortly before the second international. She was a melee agility hero with all around fine stats. Her agility was high, her movement speed was above average, and she had good starting armor. Her strength was a bit on the lower end, but not unusually so for an agility hero. The bigger problems Phantom Assassin had were her low base attack damage and terrible intelligence. She was the dumbest hero in the game, which severely limited her ability to cast spells and use items. Luckily, Phantom Assassin's abilities didn't use much mana. Her first ability was Stifling Dagger. Stifling Dagger had Phantom Assassin throw a dagger at target enemy. This dagger did a small bit of pure damage and applied a short but powerful slow. Stifling Dagger dealt double damage to creeps, which made it a reasonably strong tool for securing last hits, especially when considering its massive 1200 range. Stifling Dagger had a cooldown of 8 seconds and a mana cost that started out at 30 and then decreased to 15. Unfortunately, an 8 second cooldown was quite long when put into the context of last hitting during the laning stage. Usually, multiple creeps got to low HP at about the same time, and so it was difficult to use Stifling Dagger to get more than one last hit per creep wave. A 30 mana cost was also actually fairly high when considering Phantom Assassin's low mana pool. And when fighting heroes, Stifling Dagger didn't do any significant damage and was fully blocked by BKB, making it a lackluster tool once the laning stage was over. Stifling Dagger wasn't particularly strong, but it was usable. Getting extra last hits, especially from a distance, was always good on melee carries, and the slow could be useful in many circumstances. Phantom Assassin's second ability was Phantom Strike. 
Phantom Strike teleported Phantom Assassin to any other unit. If that unit was an enemy, then Phantom Assassin gained 100% bonus attack speed for 4 attacks on that enemy. Phantom Strike had a high cast range of 1000 units and a low cooldown and mana cost. 100% bonus attack speed may sound really impressive, but sadly, it was a lie. Old Dota expressed itself in percentage attack speed values, which was eventually dropped in favor of our current system of stating attack speed as a simple integer. This was purely a difference in language. 100% attack speed in 2012 is 100 attack speed today. Phantom Strike did not give 100% bonus attack speed, it gave 100 bonus attack speed. It was still a fine ability, although with one significant problem. Melee carries needed to get close to their targets to attack them, and Phantom Strike did an excellent job at that on a low cooldown. It also occasionally provided her with some additional utility as she could Phantom Strike to her allies to get out of danger. However, Phantom Strike couldn't be cast on magic immune enemies. This limited the ability significantly in the middle of important late game fights, as BKB has always been and probably will always be a core component of late game Dota. Phantom Strike was meant to be PA's gap closing tool, but she often couldn't actually use it to get close to the enemy cores, and so it was a much weaker ability than it could have been. Phantom Assassin's third ability was Blur. Blur was a passive that increased Phantom Assassin's evasion by up to 35% and made her disappear from the minimap if enemy heroes ran a 1600 radius around her. Blur did not make Phantom Assassin invisible in any sort of way, but simply made her hidden on the minimap. This gave her an interesting level of meta protection, where unless her opponents were directly looking at her on their screen, they couldn't spot her through their team's vision on the minimap. When going up against uncoordinated opponents that weren't actively communicating, like most pub teams, then PA could get sneaky kills without her opponents realizing what was happening. However, the higher the skill level, the more likely it became that any such attempts would get cooled out via voice chat. In addition to that, Blur also had a 1.5 second delay before Phantom Assassin became hidden or revealed again, which gave ample time to spot her once her assault started. Blur was an interesting ability because its usefulness scaled inversely with player skill. The better the players, the less likely they were to be tricked by Blur, and at very high skill levels, this property of Blur arguably became a non-factor. On the other hand, Evasion was definitely a useful property to have, but by itself wasn't quite enough to be called a worthwhile ability. Especially since at the time, Monkey King Bar was a common late game item choice that completely invalidated any sort of evasion due to the true strike it provided. While I don't usually talk about Warcraft 3 Dota, because the videos will get very long, I have to include one little fun fact about the old Blur. A feature of Blur that was not transferred to Dota 2 was that it used to make Phantom Assassin very difficult to see. This was another meta ability that only impacted the players, as she wasn't invisible in any mechanical sense, but instead simply blended into the background, which made her physically hard to spot, particularly in the middle of a teamfight. Blur was one of the main reasons why we got mad at new players for not having turned on health bars, as without them she was impossible to find and then they would get repeatedly killed without ever figuring out who was attacking them. But I digress. According to Dota Cinema's Hero Spotlight video from June 7th, 2012, this effect was ported into Dota 2 and it's clearly visible in their video. However, savvy viewer that you are, I'm sure that you noticed that their video predates the release of the hero by 4 days. This indicates that Blur must have been changed to no longer have that property, fairly close to the release of the hero, which I think is interesting. Phantom Assassin's ultimate was Coup de Grasse. Coup de Grasse was a passive ability that gave Phantom Assassin a 15% chance to deal the highest critical strike in the game, upwards of 400%. But certainly a simple ability, cool, hurt. A critical strike launched by a farmed Phantom Assassin was the most powerful attack in the game. Phantom Assassin was a simple hero from a simple time. 
All her abilities were incredibly straightforward and could be explained in two lines of text or less. While certainly helpful for new players, that was not a good sign for her competitive chances. Being a carry in 2012 was different from being a carry today. In modern Dota, if the safe lane carry falls short, then the mid can take over. And if the mid struggles as well, then the offlane can try to make up for it. In 2012, the mid was there to make space for the carry, and the offlane was a supporting role. The carry had to carry, and if the carry failed, the game was lost. Recovering when behind was also extremely tough, because there were no comeback mechanisms inherent to the gold mechanics like today. There were no bounty runes or tormentors, and Roshan was placed right in the center of the map, where getting a sneaky kill was nearly impossible. To do their job, carries had to farm reliably, while never falling behind and getting the most out of the very limited resources they had available. There were only 6 creep camps in each jungle. Taking those early was quite challenging because of the lower power level of all heroes and the inherent difficulty of traversing the map. The modern Dota map is built as a collection of small arenas that are openly connected with each other and have points of interest and juking spots for fights. But the old Dota map was a series of long, empty corridors that locked heroes into their movement as they traversed between lanes. Moving through the jungle today is mostly a straight line between any of the places a hero might want to go. But back in the day, the map enforced its will upon the players. For example, going from the top rune spot to the dire pull camp required the player to either walk up a narrow corridor that was easily contested or to take a lengthy detour through their own jungle. Farming on the whole was slower and much more difficult. This was all made even more complicated because the International 2012 was dominated by pushing strategies. Out of the top 7 most contested heroes, 5 were pushers and the average match length was only 35 minutes. Farming was a component of play, but there weren't enough creep camps on the map to sustain more than one hero's inventory. If a support wanted to afford anything other than wards, then their team had to kill towers for their massive bounties. And ideally, those towers were killed early to build momentum. A carry had to either be able to farm up quickly enough before a pushing team finished the match, or be able to push themselves, or be strong enough early game to defend their towers. All of these restrictions and harsh requirements meant that the carry hero pool at TI2 was minuscule. And since Dota only had a small number of bans during the drafting stage, the same couple of heroes were being picked over and over again. Morphling, Lone Druid, Chaos Knight, Anti-Mage. And for the small number of games when they weren't banned, Naga Siren and Lycan. The elites of 2012 were powerful and intimidating. Phantom Assassin unfortunately did not have what it took to compete. That's not to say that nobody tried. In their group stages match against IG, Complexity used Phantom Assassin as an aggressive tri-lane carry. Stifling Dagger had a low cooldown and a powerful slow. This was very strong in aggressive tri-lane situations, as tri-lane fights would usually rely on attacks as their primary source of damage, and spells mainly served as disables. Phantom Strike could also be effective, as it allowed Phantom Assassin to easily land those valuable attacks. As you probably already guessed, her skill build was maxing out Stifling Dagger first and Phantom Strike second, with a single point into Blur early and her ultimate whenever available. This skill build stays the same for the rest of the video, so I won't mention it again. Complexity's aggressive trialing worked out quite well, but as laning came to a close, the tides shifted immediately. IG started pushing and Complexity had no way to defend. Phantom Assassin was forced into building anything she could to help with defending, which ended up being face boots and a vanguard. This left her without any damage, which then also slowed down her farming significantly. Again, keep in mind that the baseline power level of all the heroes was much lower than what we see today. Even something as simple as farming a jungle camp was hard, unless specifically itemized for it. 
and taking tower kills was a much more effective and faster way of securing gold. By 25 minutes, PA only had half the net worth of IG's carries, and by 35, the game was over. While Complexity's early laning plan worked out well, as soon as IG started applying tower pressure, Complexity were left playing 4 vs 5, and they stood no chance. Another attempt came from Na'Vi, playing Phantom Assassin against Tong Fu as a traditional safe lane carry, which at the time meant that she would participate in some pushing efforts while focusing on farming creeps in between pushes. Na'Vi quickly took the top tower and then tried to maintain pressure, but unfortunately Phantom Assassin couldn't contribute as much as her team needed. Tong Fu then turned the momentum around and soon Na'Vi fell behind. However, Havos on the Phantom Assassin had the right idea. Never play defense. He built Battle Fury to maximize his farming and moved greedily with his team. At 18 minutes, Navi tried to sneakily kill Roshan, but IG spotted them. Can they stay in the game? <laughs> In a miracle moment, Navi turned the match around. From here they played clean, simple Dota. They took towers on good intervals and gave PA the space she needed to finish Battle Fury, Vladimir's offering, BKB and Monkey King Bar. But even with all of that, Phantom Assassin remained unimpressive. At level 19 with a nearly full inventory, she didn't even have 1500 health and because her main damage amplifier was a critical strike, sometimes she just didn't get it and then she couldn't do much damage. While Navi won the game, neither them nor any other team picked Phantom Assassin again. She was simply too unreliable and couldn't do what was required of her to see competitive play. After TI2, Coup de Grasse had its critical strike damage increased. A 450% critical strike was much higher than anything comparable. Phantom Assassin could hit for multiple thousands of damage once she had items and her ultimate maxed out. While this change was certainly strong, it also made her depend even more on that 15% chance. Then Blur had its evasion chance slightly buffed, which didn't help much. The main issue Blur had was being entirely useless in the late game. Monkey King Bar was an incredibly popular item for attack based carries and at the time it provided absolute true strike, which made it so that all the attacks completely ignored evasion. As soon as Phantom Assassin was going up against MKB, she completely lost one of her abilities and Blur's evasion chance getting a buff didn't help in any way. That combined with her other issues and the high competency expected of a carry meant that she wasn't picked at all at the International 2013. TI3 was a brutal tournament, with the top carries being heroes like Viva, Lifestealer and Alchemist, all of which had designs so strong that they lasted all the way to modern Dota 2 largely unchanged. A hero as basic as Phantom Assassin simply didn't have what it took. Because of this, some more depth was introduced to Phantom Assassin after TI3. In 6.79, Stifling Dagger became able to crit with Coup de Grasse. This didn't change the way it dealt its damage, so to be clear, a Stifling Dagger critical strike didn't trigger an attack from Phantom Assassin and instead only amplified the set pure damage the ability dealt. Stifling Dagger also had its damage rescaled to be slightly stronger early but weaker late. However, the ability to crit with it ultimately increased its overall damage output, which was still not very significant. At its most, Stifling Dagger dealt 405 damage. But then, it had its cooldown reduced to 6 seconds, which was actually really nice, and combined with the recent damage boost at level 1, Stifling Dagger became a much better laning tool. Patch 6.80 buffed Blur by reducing its delay to half and letting it trigger on invisible heroes. When Blur was active and hiding Phantom Assassin, this was indicated via a buff icon 
which meant that Phantom Assassin became able to tell if an invisible hero was in a 1600 radius around her. This wasn't quite as useful as it may seem, as 1600 radius was fairly large, but helpful nonetheless. Funnily enough, this element became more valuable the higher the skill level of all players. Finally, in 6.81, Phantom Strike and Blur had their numbers slightly increased and then it was time for the next international. Hello friends, thank you very much for watching the video so far, don't worry it will continue in a second. I am just here to ask you to leave a thumbs up on the video if you enjoyed it so far and of course to consider becoming a channel member which is the best way to support us. That way you can support us directly so we can continue making these videos. Keep in mind we can only upload one video a month because the videos take a long time to produce so we really rely on that one video being you know, effective, I suppose. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. I wanted to thank you for that, particularly the response to the Meepo video has been great. Uh, if we could keep that up, you know, give a thumbs up and so on, that would be great. Anyway, let's get ourselves back to the story of Phantom Assassin. Newbie versus LGD Gaming, the international four group stages. The early game went by fairly evenly as both teams focused on farming. Phantom Assassin played the mid, as was standard at the time. The newly buffed Stifling Dagger made an excellent last hitting tool. In the mid, she could keep her distance and spam Dagger to secure a baseline level of farm that was nearly impossible to prevent because of its 1200 cast range. While Phantom Assassin couldn't apply enough pressure on the opposing hero to truly win the lane, that wasn't her goal anyway. As a carry, she was much more inward focused, playing for her own goals as opposed to interrupting her opponents. By 10 minutes, she was tied for most last hits in the game and was well on her way towards a battle fury, a farming item that would allow her to build a strong economy and get the other items she needed. But as soon as Newbie got Vladimir's offering on Lycan and a few levels on Nature's Prophet and Shadow Shaman, they started pushing. First, the bottom tower, then mid, then top. Like clockwork, Newbie unrelentingly took towers whenever they could. They did this even at the cost of losing fights. Newbie would happily trade their lives to take tower kills. Whenever Shadow Shaman's ultimate was ready, the next objective would fall. Roshan, bottom tier 2, mid tier 2. In the meantime, Phantom Assassin was farming. She had her battle fury and hadn't died yet. By all reasonable expectations for the hero, she was doing well. And it didn't matter whatsoever. Newbie simply kept pushing. By 25 minutes they had built an insurmountable lead where even their supports had more money than LGD's safe lane carry. Phantom Assassin tried her best, but what could she have done? In the final clash between the two teams, she couldn't even get close enough to attack and LGD surrendered while their strongest hero was still alive. This match is exemplary of why Phantom Assassin couldn't be picked. She, like many other carries of the time, was too slow to contest the aggressive pushing strategies of the top teams. The more the tournament progressed, the more they were forced out and replaced by fast-paced pushing heroes like Razor, Nature's Prophet and Lycan. Phantom Assassin wasn't alone here. The only traditional carries that survived the acceleration of the meta were Morphling and Naga Siren. But even if that wasn't the case, Phantom Assassin still wouldn't have been a good choice. The game between the teams DK and Arrow lasted over 70 minutes. In this match she had everything she could ask for, a full inventory of items and still she couldn't do anything. Coup de Grasse was her only damage amplification ability but it relied on a 15% chance. 85% of the time, Phantom Assassin had no scaling whatsoever. She also had no way to protect herself in fights and was entirely dependent on BKB. As soon as its duration ran out, she was left stranded and often dead. While the meta was inhospitable to Phantom Assassin, her biggest problems could actually be summed up in only 8 words. No crit, no damage, no BKB, no life. She was only picked 4 times at the International 4 and she lost all of those games. Phantom Assassin was bad.
After this disappointing performance, Blur was reworked in 6.82 and now had the opposite effect regarding the minimap. Instead of hiding Phantom Assassin when she was near enemy heroes, she now disappeared when far away from them. This made much more sense. Blur now allowed Phantom Assassin to farm without being visible on the minimap. Warding her jungle and ganking her became much more difficult, so much so that in 6.83, Coup de Grasse was slightly nerfed. However, both those changes were dwarfed by the fundamental rework to Dota 2's core economy that came with 6.82. Tower bounties were drastically reduced and hero kill bounties started scaling with net worth. The average game length shot up by 5 minutes and consequently farming as a strategy became available for a much wider cast of heroes. I don't mean to imply that farming wasn't done before this point, but the burden of power that had to be met for a hero to be effective in that role had been lowered. 6.82 evened the playing field in a way that could only happen once in Dota's history. It is one of the most significant patches of all time. 6.84 then introduced a large selection of new items. Amongst those, Phantom Assassin was most bothered by Silver Edge, which had an active effect that made its user invisible and had them apply bonus damage as well as break on their next attack. Break was a debuff that disabled passive abilities. Phantom Assassin hated this item. It disabled half her abilities and without her passives, the remaining two couldn't do much. Luckily for her, Silver Edge wasn't very good and only saw spare use. At the International 2015, Phantom Assassin was only picked a single time. And by who else other than Na'Vi. They had her playing a solo safe lane, which would likely have been a disaster if not for Havost, the absolute madman. Havost getting dove under the tower. Uh, they're going for it. Havost trying to look for the dupes here, trying to keep himself oh! alive. Oh! He fights one much! No way! Go. Oh, oh my! Havost! Navi also paired Phantom Assassin with Magnus, whose empower enabled her to farm without needing a battle fury. This allowed her to focus on fighting items going Helm of the Dominator into BKB into Basher. And then Hawast did what Hawast did best. And Fennec, they want to fight Kyo. Can Havos find the Bastions? Well, he can't when he can't see him. Kyo with the hits, with the essence shift, doing what he can, blinking forward. And wants to try and clear this one up. Looks for Fennec. Fennec getting low. Jimmy has Fennec. No, Fennec blinks. Denies himself to Roche. And Havos with the Bastions. Gets himself an ultra kill. Havos is able to clean up at the end of what an incredible fight between the two sides. And let's have a look at the fight. But as the game went late, Phantom Assassin ran into a new wall. MKB to invalidate Blur and BKB to prevent Phantom Strike and Stifling Dagger. Two incredibly common items that turned her into a hero with only one ability. Navi lost this game and nobody else even tried Phantom Assassin. Why would a team pick a late game carry with three abilities that became useless as soon as her opponents bought the most standard late game items? While Dota as a whole had become more hospitable for heroes like Phantom Assassin, that only made her specific flaws even more glaring. Phantom Assassin simply had no place in competitive Dota. She was bad and the teams that picked her shouldn't have. Phantom Assassin was finally ready for some proper adjustments. Blur was changed to no longer have a delay. This made it possible for her to instantly tell when an enemy hero entered into a 1600 radius around her, giving her even more safety when farming. Phantom Strike became castable on magic immune enemies. It was no longer blocked by BKB, which made it actually usable in late game fights. Finally, and most importantly, Stifling Dagger was reworked to be an attack based ability. Instead of dealing set damage, it now dealt 75 physical damage and up to 70% of Phantom Assassin's attack damage, which counted as an attack on the target. Because Stifling Dagger was now an attack, 
it could apply all attack modifiers like Lifesteal or Skull Basher, and of course, it could crit. Stifling Dagger now scaled. It was no longer an ability that was only useful during the laning stage, and instead it kept its relevance throughout the entire game, always giving Phantom Assassin an option to attack from range. Dota 2 has always been an immensely popular game. In 2016, it held a concurrent player base of over 1 million and even reached its all-time peak of 1.3 million players. Despite that, Dota 2 never fully gripped South Korea and only a small number of teams and players ever emerged from the birthplace of esports. One such team was MVP Phoenix at the International 2016. And on MVP Phoenix, one player was essential to Phantom Assassin's story. QO, their unfathomably aggressive mid. If Hawast's hyper-aggressive playstyle made him a madman, then QO was a fucking psychopath. Looking for the impale, will be able to hit it on Misery. Not quite the target he wanted. He wanted Moo, but will still be able to get him. Thanks to Spike Hair Base, it's a little bit of space. The more staff forward, Moo will be able to get the flick dagger. No, the dagger comes in and a crit. Executes him. Resolution now is left with him and Foxa up against Q only. Will be able to take away the nations, but a crit again. On cooldown, looking for Forever, the two mats done. Forever getting pulled down. The five last ones of Bevy. How takes two. And now on towards Cure, who jumps back towards MP. MP jumps away from Q and says, Son, you're on your own. Kuro tries to slow down the full seeds with the dagger, but Newbie then quick to chase Tron with the fire blast to Newbie. They want to kill this PA anyone for Kuro to jump to. Yes, tag team's on to MP. Look to KP. KP hits the stun onto MP. Newbie, he's going to be coming across another oh, kill from Kuro. He does it. They just can't kill him. And now Newbie with another strike on the hell. Kuro jumps in. Tron's still there with the back up. Now the Kuro from MP. On to three. Kuro comes back in. Takes the hell. The grit's on to Tron. He's going to get himself up. Kyo completely ignored conventional carry strategies and redefined Phantom Assassin as an aggressive tempo mid. Generally speaking, the time to kill in the early game used to be higher than during the late game. Fighting during the early game would give Phantom Assassin more opportunities to connect with attacks and land a critical strike. Blur would also be much more useful as nobody could afford an MKB that early in a match, and being hidden on the minimap meant she could walk right through wards undetected while setting up ganks. Cure rejected the idea of Phantom Assassin as a late game carry and instead fully embraced early aggression. His item build always followed the same path. Face boots and some early stats like Bottle, Poor Man's Shield or Ring of Aquila, and then Desolator and BKB. Sometimes he would squeeze in a Vladimir's Offering or Skull Basher. He made no attempt at farming and wouldn't even look at the old Battle Fury approach. Kuo was all about tempo. He often led the charge, pushing his team to get kills and take objectives. MVP always killed Roshan early and frequently. Aegis of the Immortal was basically a core item on Kyo, as it allowed him to play incredibly recklessly. And reckless is the key word here. Kyo frequently took fights where the odds were clearly against him, fights that he frankly shouldn't have taken. But that's where Phantom Assassin was perfect. Just in the same way that Coup de Grasse could result in her losing fights that she should have won, it also gave her the opportunity to win fights that she should have lost. And Kuo was blessed. Whether it was by chance or because he never stopped attacking, Kuo always landed critical strikes when he needed them most. 
Relying on Phantom Assassin, MVP Phoenix slaughtered their way through the group stage, winning every single game they played with her and most of them decisively. MVP's bloodbath continued in the upper bracket as they absolutely ruined two-time major champions for the 2016 season and eventual back-to-back -back TI winners, OG. Only the best team of the tournament could put a stop to their winning streak. As you will be able to see in the following clip, Vinx Gaming and their unparalleled control during teamfights broke MVP Phoenix's momentum. Oh, Ice Ice is isolated and he is gonna get caught. And a strike back to back in. Ghost Scepter coming in. And the Toronto on the two. First foot of the follow up. MP Static Storm. He will fall. He will go down as well. MVP about to lose everything. It's a massacre, Mod. They can't stand against Wing. Even when they. But even after going 0 2 against Wings, MVP's next and final opponents. Fnatic decided they would rather ban Phantom Assassin than give QO another chance to unleash the beast. MVP's run ended at 5th place, the best performance of any Korean team up to this point and Phantom Assassin was their most picked hero. Apart from MVP, Phantom Assassin was only played in a single other game, picked by Alliance who tried to imitate MVP style but they didn't play aggressively enough and PA ended up having little impact on the game. Up to this point in history, Phantom Assassin had been viewed exclusively as a late game carry and MVP style was an unheard of rogue strategy. They had found a way for Phantom Assassin to get around the wall as MKV wasn't relevant in games that ended before it could be purchased. This approach carried them to a 5th place finish, winning nearly $1 million in prize pool. But along the way, Phantom Assassin hit a new wall. Vinx countered her by purchasing Ghost Scepter on 3 different heroes, which completely negated Phantom Assassin's ability to deal damage to them and wasted her precious BKB. Vinx combined Ghost Scepter with 4 staff and excellent defensive play and Phantom Assassin simply couldn't find any opportunities. Regardless, the International 2016 was a spectacular year for Phantom Assassin. While only a single team played her, by the end of the tournament, that team had left their mark on history and Phantom Assassin had found a new playstyle. After the International 6, Dota 7.0 was released. To be frank, a lot of the balance decisions made during this time period were quite questionable. After all, this is the patch that introduced the original Monkey King. I don't want to be too harsh here, as Valve had just introduced talent trees, which added a huge number of complicated new elements that needed to be balanced. This is all a roundabout way of trying to justify that Phantom Assassin got nerfed, and fairly significantly at that. Stifling Dagger had its base damage reduced to 65 and its cast range drastically cut during the early levels. These changes made Stifling Dagger a much worse tool for early last hitting, which was the only reliable strength Phantom Assassin had. All she got in return was a quite mediocre talent tree with very few interesting or noteworthy elements. But as Phantom Assassin wasn't a problematic hero, and at that current point in time, Valve had many problem heroes to focus on, she didn't receive any more changes before the International 7. At TI7, a less extreme version of Kyo's style became the new standard for Phantom Assassin. Farming items had disappeared from her item build entirely and instead players focused on Desolator and early tempo plays. Unfortunately, the nurse she had received and her fairly mediocre talents had weakened her early power, making it more difficult for her to use her early opportunities to build momentum. But when Phantom Assassin managed to snowball quickly, then she could maintain a level of aggression that was incredibly difficult to deal with and usually overwhelmed the opposing carries before they had a chance to fight back. But when she didn't, then she turned into a bad late game carry that was countered by any variety of standard late game items. 
Her lack of innate defensive options apart from evasion also made her entirely dependent on BKB for protection against the Sables. While a reliance on BKB wasn't unusual, Phantom Assassins was quite extreme, which made her a difficult choice to justify. Although, she did have an interesting niche, which was that she performed quite well against Drow Strats. Phantom Strike allowed her to easily close the distance to Drow Ranger and Blur protected her from the precision aura damage. She still wasn't good and there were other, more all-around powerful options available to play against Drow Ranger, but it was a genuine niche that Phantom Assassin had. At TI-7, Phantom Assassin was a risky tempo carry that saw limited use. She wasn't terrible, but there were plenty of better options available. 7 picks, 4 wins. Even Kyo had stopped playing her as much as before, but he still earned a couple of respect bans. Over the next year, Phantom Assassin continued to be buffed. While there were a couple of other minor changes, the biggest ones came to her talents. Her talent tree was reworked to this. Of particular note here were her level 15 talents. 20% cleave was quite strong as an additional farming tool and the minus 4 armor corruption acted as a significant damage boost, especially if she already had a desolator. The level 20 double strike stifling dagger talent also ended up getting buffed to be a triple strike instead. This was particularly useful as Stifling Dagger was also changed to no longer be blocked by BKB. Phantom Assassin's new talents finally gave her some real late game power, which was only helped even more by the long-awaited rework of Monkey King Bar. In patch 7.07, .07, Monkey King Bar was changed to be significantly cheaper, but it no longer provided absolute true strike. Instead, MKB now gave a 75% chance to bypass evasion. While this still effectively reduced Phantom Assassin's evasion chance significantly, it no longer completely nullified one of her abilities. Patch 7.07 .07 also added Nullifier into the game. Nullifier was a late game item that was built out of a sacred relic and a helm of Iron Will. It provided the combined stats and had an active effect that dispelled the target and muted them for 5 seconds, preventing them from using items. During this period, any attack landed on that target would also slow them by 100% for 0.4 seconds. Nullifier was a dream come true for Phantom Assassin. It dealt with Ghost Scepter by either dispelling it if the item was already active, or by stopping the target from using it in the first place. While it wasn't a perfect tool to stop her opponents from going ethereal, it helped significantly. And it provided nice stats for Phantom Assassin, who was mostly concerned with damage. Nullifier is going to be a standard item for the hero whenever needed going forward. The changes Phantom Assassin received over the previous year were all good and necessary, but they were also only a handful of them which was bad news for her at the International 2018. This was the era when Dota really started to power creep. While playing a passive, dagger-based build in the mid was a viable strategy at TI6, if a team had tried the same at TI8, then they would have quickly gotten overwhelmed, because PA was letting the opposing mid free farm and due to the higher power level, they could use that money to snowball in a much more dangerous way than was previously possible. The same was true for the other lanes. A stifling dagger every 6 seconds simply wasn't what it had been in the past. Every other hero had been continuously buffed, but Phantom Assassin hadn't changed that much. And now, Phantom Assassin couldn't lane, she couldn't build momentum, and she was terrible late game. At TI-8, she was only picked twice, and those picks couldn't have gone worse for her teams. She contributed nothing and lost both games badly. It was finally time for Phantom Assassin to catch up to the ever-increasing power creep of the post-7.0 era. 7.20 and its following patches introduced many changes to her. Phantom Strike had its cooldown, cast point and mana cost reduced and its attack speed bonus increased. It was also changed to no longer be limited to a set number of attacks on a specific target 
and instead simply provided Phantom Assassin bonus attack speed for 2.5 seconds, regardless of which target she was attacking. This added some much welcome flexibility to Phantom Strike. Blur was also reworked. It no longer hit Phantom Assassin on the minimap and instead gained an active component that made Phantom Assassin completely invisible for 25 seconds. This invisibility couldn't be detected and wasn't broken by attacking or casting spells, but it ended as soon as Phantom Assassin got within 600 units of an enemy hero or building. Even then, it still had a 0.75 second buffer. This active ability had a fairly long cooldown of up to 60 seconds and a low mana cost. Blur retained its passive evasion chance. The reworked Blur was a much more direct and powerful version of the same idea of the previous iteration. Now Phantom Assassin was truly hidden while farming and the only way to know that she was in a lane was to pay close attention to the pace at which the creeps died. These two changes left Phantom Assassin in a quite powerful position and so she was nerfed in a variety of ways over the next few letter patches. Notable here were a variety of mana cost increases and early coup de grace damage reductions. Then 7.21 moved some of her talents around and reduced her agility gain. In 7.22 she gained an Aghanim Scepter upgrade. With it, Blur lost its cast point, meaning it activated instantly when used and it also applied a dispel. Its cooldown was also reduced to only 12 seconds and the Aghanim Scepter made it so that whenever Phantom Assassin got a kill on an enemy hero, all of her abilities cooldowns were refreshed. This was a very powerful effect, but unfortunately required Phantom Assassin to build an Aghanim Scepter, which didn't provide useful stats for the hero. However, 7.22 also added the consumable Aghanim Scepter and the Aghanim Scepter drop from Roshan. So in very long games, Phantom Assassin could reasonably get this upgrade. In the following letter patches, PA's talents were buffed again and made significantly stronger. While these talents were almost entirely generic, they were quite powerful and provided the exact stats she needed. And at level 25, plus 10% coup de grace chance nearly doubled the power of the ability. Finally, having received her long overdue upgrades, the International 2019 rolled around. The new blur made Phantom Assassin a shadow on the map, never to be seen unless she wants it. She had near-perfect camouflage while farming and hunting her down required serious commitment. That and her recent changes that nerfed her early power and placed stronger emphasis on her high-level talents resulted in Phantom Assassin moving back to the late-game carry role for the International 9. Her item build became a blend of the old-school farming style and Qo's aggression. An early battle fury allowed her to clear creeps quickly and Desolator then gave her the damage she needed to hit powerful critical strikes against heroes. Afterwards, a defensive item was needed, usually BKB, but sometimes also Aghanim Scepter. Aghanim Scepter offered Phantom Assassin a small additional buffer to her survivability that could help reduce her reliance on BKB. While the stats it provided weren't good, it was usually fine to buy it after she already had some damage. While this made sense in theory, in practice, it didn't work well. Purchasing Battle Fury before Desolator and BKB meant that Phantom Assassin simply took too long to get into fighting shape to contribute during the early game and her Aghanim Scepter simply wasn't as effective as people had hoped it would be. Despite all of her changes, she was still an utterly unremarkable late game carry. Her damage was undeniably impressive when she landed those 3000 damage crits, but when she didn't, she had nothing. MKB still mostly countered Blur and Ku was incredibly unreliable when compared to other damage boosting abilities. The top carries of the tournament were Alchemist and Lifestealer and Gyrocopter, all of which had reliable abilities that always performed to a certain standard, which is something that Phantom Assassin couldn't guarantee. Her best performances came when she was paired with Magnus, who allowed her to skip Battle Fury and build straight into the necessary damage and protection items, but even that didn't fix how unreliable she was. By TI9, Another important development in Dota's overarching meta had happened. 
The game was slowly but surely moving away from sieging with an entire team being the primary way of pushing a base. Instead, teams would fight outside of their bases and then use the window of opportunity given after that fight to push. One of the many reasons why heroes like Tiny and Le Shock were excellent was because they were able to push even if they were the only ones to survive a fight. But Phantom Assassin's only damage boosting ability was a critical strike, and critical strikes didn't work on buildings. Even if a team with a Phantom Assassin won a fight, they wouldn't be able to push in the same way they would have been able to if, for example, they had a Sven or Tiny on their team instead. I've been making a lot of comparisons to other heroes for this tournament, because Phantom Assassin had now reached a power level where she was worth considering for the late game carry role. But she was always just a bit worse at most things than the other options available, which made her a bad pick. The one hero that truly added insult to injury was Urshaker. Urshaker had recently started seeing play as a physical burst damage hero, relying on critical strike to enhance an enchant totem empowered attack. But because he used Daedalus for his critical strike, he had a 30% chance instead of PA's lackluster 15%. He was better at making giant crits happen than the hero designed to make giant crits happen. Not only was his physical damage comparable, but he also offered significant other utility with his remaining abilities that Phantom Assassin simply couldn't compete with. Her only saving grace was that she was very hard to find while farming, which was a legitimate niche. It just wasn't enough of one. 12 picks, 4 bans, 41% win rate, and a largely disappointing performance in most of her games. Phantom Assassin still wasn't good and had been struggling, but she had no idea and wasn't ready for how bad it was about to become. The International 10 was delayed for a year, so there are many changes to cover. Allow me to summarize. Phantom Assassin's base damage was increased by an incredible 8. This was a massive change that instantly made her much better at every stage of the game. As for her abilities, Stifling Dagger received some minor adjustments to its cast range and slow duration, Phantom Strike had its attack speed bonus slightly reduced, Blur now had a shorter fate time without Aghanim Scepter and a shorter cooldown with. Ku was left untouched. Most importantly, Phantom Assassin gained a new ability with the introduction of the Aghanim's Shard. Fan of Nice was an active ability that dealt damage in a 550 AoE around Phantom Assassin and applied break for 3 seconds to any target's hit. The damage dealt was pure and a percentage of the target's maximum HP. At first only 12%, but this was soon buffed to be 16%. Fan of Nice initially had an unusually high mana cost and cooldown for Phantom Assassin, but this also didn't last long and was soon adjusted to be more in line with her other abilities. From that point on, Fan of Nice was an amazing ability. Truly just excellent. A large amount of percent damage in an AoE would have been solid by itself, but it also applied break, which was incredibly rare and highly desirable. Fan of Nice felt like Val's attempt at fixing PA by giving her a really powerful new spell. With the International 10, we entered the era of modern Dota 2. The map was starting to be filled with more and more resources and valuable objectives. While this may seem like a blessing for late game carries, many of the new objectives were tied to specific timings. Neutral items, Aghanim Shard, and a TI-10, Roshan. While the first Roshan kill varied in timing, Roshan only took 8 to 11 minutes to respawn. Being ready for the second and third kill was crucial at TI-10. The second Roshan dropped an Aghanim's Shard and the third Ivan Aghanim's Blessing or a Refresher Shard. These rewards were incredibly valuable and had to be contested. After Roshan fell for the first time, a timer was forced onto all players. They had 8 minutes to get ready to fight. Everything started becoming more and more timing based and those timings were different than they had been in the past. They were forced timings, enacted upon the players. Heroes that couldn't keep up with this new rhythm struggled to stay relevant. 
Phantom Assassin was not a popular hero at the International 10. She depended on items to become powerful, but didn't have an inbuilt flash farming tool. To put it simply, she couldn't kill ancient stacks by herself, which had become the premier way of getting a carry farmed up quickly. She could only farm them after she had finished a battle fury or if she had been paired with Magnus who could give her a cleave through his empower ability. If she had that, then the invisibility provided by Blur made sure she had no problems clearing those stacks. But Battle Fury took too long to buy and the problem with Magnus was that he was extremely popular, frequently banned and often better paired with other heroes. Keeping up with the specific rhythm of the game was so important that when Ame from PSG LGD played Phantom Assassin, he purchased an early Maelstrom which was an entirely non-synergistic item, but it was slightly cheaper than the usual options and that allowed him to play into the timings better and participate in early fights. But if he was going to buy a Maelstrom, then why pick Phantom Assassin? Other options that actually synergized with the items were simply better at that point. While everything that I mentioned so far were problems Phantom Assassin faced, at TI-10, another major hurdle roared its ugly face. Remember Silver Edge, the item I mentioned 6 tournaments ago? Up to this point in history, Silver Edge had been nothing more than a side note. An item that only acted as a late game upgrade to Shadowblade when there was nothing else left to buy. Only rarely was it bought for purpose and then mostly just to counter specifically Bristleback. However, Patch 7.30 had changed its recipe and buffed its numbers and now it had become one of the most common items on any attack based carry regardless of if there are specific targets for its break available. To give some perspective, one year ago at TI9, Silver Edge was bought a total of 19 times. At TI10, it was purchased 147 times. If Phantom Assassin got broken, her two passive abilities were disabled and she became truly worthless. This meant that she couldn't be picked against any heroes that liked buying Silvage, as otherwise she stood no chance in the late game. But that meant she couldn't be picked in the vast majority of games. In a weird twist of fate, the one viable niche Phantom Assassin had was centered entirely around break. Her Aghanim's Shard was truly just a fantastic spell and quite possibly the single best tool for dealing with tanky heroes that relied on passive abilities like Spectre, Tidehunter and Mars. The percentage based pure damage sliced through high health pools like nothing and because Aghanim's Shard was much cheaper than Silver Edge, Phantom Assassin could get her break online with less commitment than other heroes. Watch how Team Spirit made Tidehunter look squishy. Two minutes and a half left on Yatora's Aegis. They're going to try and jump in first of a quick time of the Nightmare and the Tender and Sin. Yatora's going to be fine. Arena down. They're locked in the three of them. Both the fighters are true. I don't think they're going to make it the three. JT's gone again. No chance for a Ravage. And the Tidehunter gets destroyed by Spirit's incredible physical damage. The Phantom Knives as well from Yatora. Two in the one. Now the Ravage comes out. Finger full up in there with the heel. Back up to full HP, Galaxy is good to go, JT and Diver on the tide as Spirit will push on the mid Team Spirit in particular liked PA because they loved Magnus, so they played her more than other teams, but still only twice. Overall, the Phantom Assassin was picked 5 times at the International 10, winning 2 of those games. It's worth mentioning here that in one of those games she could have been any other hero and she probably would have done better. That was the game where Ame played her with Maelstrom and his team did most of the work. Phantom Assassin just wasn't good and hardly ever worth picking. Before we get started with the patch notes, I would like to mention that Phantom Assassin received a Persona in 2022 which is a specific type of skin that changes the look of a hero on a fundamental level. I'm mentioning this because I personally don't think this skin looks anything like Phantom Assassin, but because of its exclusivity, it was still fairly popular, 
and I believe that can lead to some confusion. So going forward, this is normal Phantom Assassin, this is Arcana Phantom Assassin, and this is Persona Phantom Assassin. They are all the same hero. Post TI-10, Phantom Assassin yet again only received a small number of changes. Phantom Strike was changed to now also give upwards of 25% lifesteal for its buff duration. This gave Phantom Assassin a small bit of extra survivability during fights, but unfortunately only started being really useful after she already had enough items to deal proper physical damage for lifesteal to actually matter. While undeniably a buff, it wasn't that significant. Her talents were also shifted around and generally buffed. Then in 7.32b, Phantom Assassin actually received a couple of nerfs to her stat gain and base damage. These changes likely came because of an overperformance in public games. 7.32c then lightly buffed Phantom Strike's bonus attack speed and increased Phantom Assassin's turn rate. During this time, Valve did a small oopsie and accidentally implemented Wraith Pact. If you have seen our other videos, you already know how the story of Phantom Assassin at TI-11 goes. Wraith Pact was the fifth most purchased item of the tournament, only surpassed by the big four. BKB, Blink Dagger, Aghanim Shard and Aghanim Scepter. It was encroaching on the tier of the building blocks of Dota 2. Every single hero had to be evaluated based on how well they performed against Wraith Pact. And as you might expect, Phantom Assassin was terrible against it. The Wraith Pack totem could neither be stifling daggered nor phantom struck. She wasn't good at killing the totem, and because she was a melee hero, she was nearly guaranteed to be affected by it. While BKB protected Phantom Assassin from Wraith Pact, the last thing she needed was an even bigger reliance on BKB. Silver Edge was also still running rampant, although less than before due to some nurse. But those nerfs hadn't stopped the item from being commonplace. Over the years, laning became more and more important, and by TI-11, simply surviving in a lane wasn't anywhere near good enough anymore. A lost lane meant a huge loss in momentum that could quickly snowball out of control. Phantom Assassin was so bad at laning that the strong offlaners could comfortably take on her entire lane by themselves because PA contributed very little and then it was just them against the support, which opened up their own supports to roam the map and overwhelm the other lanes. Losing a lane as badly as Phantom Assassin frequently did was often akin to losing the game. Even if she somehow managed to win a lane, as she did during Boom vs Liquid, Phantom Assassin needed to first farm a Battle Fury, then a BKB, and then a damage item before she could impact the game. And while she was doing so, her team was essentially playing 4 vs 5. The only advantage PA had was that chasing her down was a bit of a waste of time, as she was nearly impossible to find. But that didn't matter, as teams instead focused on killing Roshan, taking towers and occupying so much of the map that she had nowhere to go in the first place. Look at this push from Team Liquid and pay close attention to the minimap. Liquid aren't even that far ahead, but it's simply too early in the game for PA to be relevant. So instead of defending, she farms for the entire duration of the push and her team has to surrender their barracks. This wasn't a winning formula. But even when she managed to get enough farm, it wasn't good enough. Look at this team fight between Boom and GG. Phantom Assassin had been farming for the entire game and was second in net worth. But unlike Shadowfiend, she just didn't do any damage. On top of all of that, PA also had a lot of terrible hero matchups. Pangalia in particular was a nightmare for her as he locked her down easily and disabled her ability to attack. At the International level, Phantom Assassin wasn't just bad. She was awful. Picking her was griefing. She was only chosen for 4 matches and lost all of them horribly. Her teams were playing 4 vs 5 and they would have been better off picking nearly any other character. Or you know, actually just playing 4 vs 5 because then they wouldn't have spent so much effort farming up a terrible worthless hero. 
there was no good reason to pick Phantom Assassin at the International 11, and all of the teams that did anyway paid a heavy price for doing so. Following TI-11, Phantom Assassin received some minor number changes and a couple of small patches, and one important, major adjustment. Blur had its Vanish radius reduced from 600 to 400. This was a massive reduction. Phantom Assassin could now get incredibly close to her targets without getting detected. You have to think about Blur as if every opponent had a 600 unit circle around themselves, which Phantom Assassin couldn't enter if she wanted to stay invisible. In a hectic teamfight, these circles would be constantly moving and evading all of them was nearly impossible. 600 radius didn't leave a lot of space for gaps, as that overlapped with the attack range of many heroes and the cast range of many abilities. But 400 radius didn't. Hardly anything has 400 range. Suddenly, there were massive holes that Phantom Assassin could weave through while staying completely undetected. To be absolutely clear, putting Blur at 400 radius made it an overpowered ability. But Phantom Assassin had been, and still was, a terrible hero. Blur was an incredibly broken spell, but because it was trapped on Phantom Assassin, nobody paid much attention to it. That all changed with patch 7.34, which reworked Coup de Grasse. Instead of being a simple critical strike, it now gave Phantom Assassin a 20% chance whenever she attacked to gain the buff Deadly Focus for 6 seconds. While she had this buff, her next attack would consume it and deal a Coup de Grasse critical strike. Stifling Dagger had doubled the chance of granting her Deadly Focus. Deadly Focus had no cooldown, allowing for consecutive critical strikes. This rework finally gave Phantom Assassin the consistency she had desperately needed. While Ku still relied on a random chance, this chance was now front-loaded before the actual effect, which allowed Phantom Assassin to first fish for the chance and then once she got it, go in for the damage. The days of praying for a crit were over. Now she wouldn't fight unless it was already secured. This rework worked especially well with the recently buffed Blur and its Arganum Scepter effect. Phantom Assassin immediately became the most notorious hero in the Dota community. The complaints about her being overpowered were endless and this wasn't just true for the pub scene. Phantom Assassin was a highly contested hero during Dream League Season 21. There, she fully embraced the role of a late game carry. The idea of an aggressive Phantom Assassin had faded away. While she still contributed little during the laning stage and in early fights, during the initial days of 7.34, the meta was incredibly slow as all teams focused on farming. This was mostly because of the previous patch, 7.33, arguably the largest patch Dota has ever experienced. Amongst many other changes, the map was reworked to be 40% bigger and that extra space had been filled with a variety of additional timing-based objectives. The increased map size made Phantom Assassin impossible to find while farming. This had already been difficult, but now there were so many more hiding spots and more creep camps where she could go, and on top of that, the new warp gates opened up movement across the map in ways that hadn't been possible before. All heroes had a much easier time farming as there were simply more resources available, and so teams picked greedier heroes than ever before, even going so far as to specifically draft supports for their late game power, and then they spent the entire game farming. Phantom Assassin games in particular were very long as she purchased a Battle Fury and played for the late game. Once she had a few items, she was incredibly overwhelming. She could easily stay hidden with Blur, spamming daggers while fishing for deadly focus. Wards, vision and detection all did nothing to help spot her. The only counterplay her opponents had was to somehow get into 400 range of a hero they couldn't see. Then, when she had a critical strike queued up, she appeared, instantly killing her target, which allowed Aghanim's Scepter to reset her cooldowns and her to vanish back into Blur. Phantom Assassin 
felt unfair to play against. She became a proper assassin, patiently waiting for the right moment, then instantly killing her target before disappearing again. It's also worth keeping in mind that apart from its larger rework, Ku had its chance increased from 15% to 20%, which was a massive increase in overall damage output. Also, Phantom Assassin didn't have to play hidden. She could just go in and overpower her target. At Dream League Season 21, Phantom Assassin was contested for 62% of the tournament and had a fantastic 60% win rate. She was widely considered one of the most dangerous heroes in the game. Finally, her moment to shine at an international was about to arrive. But then, only 7 days before the competition, patch 7.34D was released and all her hopes and dreams crumbled to dust. Blur had its managed radius increased to 500, its Aghanim Scepter cooldown rescaled from a flat 10 seconds to 50% of the ability's current cooldown and the Scepter no longer increased Blur's Vanish buffer. Just in the same way that 400 was a vast improvement over 600, 500 was drastically worse than 400. That, combined with its other nurse, left Blur with nothing but a hollow memory of its brief moment of glory. Ku also had its chance nerfed to 17%. Phantom Assassin was still stronger than she had been before 7.34, but at that point she was one of the worst heroes in the game and needed more than just a slight improvement to become competitively relevant. The International 2023 was a tournament about farming and timings. The larger map encouraged teams to pick greedy heroes to use all available resources, which was contrasted by the multitude of new timing-based objectives that had to be adhered to. Lotus Pools required pickups every 3 minutes as they helped win the lane, Wisdom Ruins represented a huge experience boost every 7 minutes, and Tormentors were valuable targets for both contesting from opponents and taking your own starting at 20 minutes and then every 10 minutes afterwards. Coupled with the older, timing-based elements like Roshan, Bounty Runes and Creep Camps, Dota had become a much stricter game, enforcing specific gameplay patterns and timings, and the teams were given a choice whether to play into these timings or to play around them. This led to two main playstyles dominating the tournament. First came the obvious farming-based strategies that loved sitting back while farming creeps and repeatedly taking objectives, eventually getting full inventories on their carries and even their supports and then winning in the late game. This style often involved purchasing multiple hands of Midas and usually resulted in very long games. The International 2023 had the highest average game length of any international since the very first one. Team Spirit were a great example of this approach to the game. They played patiently and then relied on Yatoro to carry them. As a counter to this style, a second strategy that revolved around playing into the specific timings of the map became popular. Contest the minute 7 and 14 Wisdom Ruins, then push the offlane tier 2 tower by around 19 minutes, giving plenty of time to set up to contest the Tormentor. Fight over the opponent's Tormentor, win the fight, take the Tormentor and then either push barracks right away or heal up and then push with the overwhelming advantage gained by winning the Tormentor fight. This style of Tempo Dota aimed to close out games before 30 minutes. Gaming gladiators excelled at it and they often managed to overwhelm their opponents long before their carries would have been online. The existence of the aggressive tempo style placed the burden on the rest of the metagame. Every draft needed to be able to contest the minute 20 tormentor. If a team wasn't able to do so, they left themselves wide open to an early push that would either leave them incredibly far behind or outright lose them the game. 
While we had seen this kind of dichotomy before, the big difference now compared to a couple of years ago was that due to years of power creep, nearly every hero could scale well into the late game. Tempo drafts didn't have to concede if their aggression failed, they would simply pivot into a farming game and then try to win that way. The best heroes were those that could play both styles, and teams would adjust their timings based on their early game performance. Consequently, heroes that locked their team into a specific playstyle needed to be appropriately powerful to justify that loss of flexibility. And this is where Phantom Assassin failed. Due to her recent rework, she no longer had any problems being powerful once she was farmed, but she had no way to help her team before that point, which left them exposed to that early Tormentor play. This is exactly what happened during TSM vs Talon during the group stages. TSM built an early lead, then took Talon's Tormentor at minute 20, then Roshan, and then they pushed. Despite being the top net worth on her team, Phantom Assassin was practically absent and TSM won the game without any significant resistance. That's not to say that every game looked like this. As already mentioned, the International 12 had extremely long games on average. It's just that she couldn't be picked if the game looked like it might be a tempo game. While this severely limited her draft frequency, in the right game she was a powerful late game carry. Her item build followed the same as before. Boots, Battle Fury, BKB, Desolator and then Aghanim Scepter. She farmed for the early and mid game, using Blur to become undetectable and then after she had her items, Phantom Assassin became an impressive physical damage carry. She was particularly great at taking Roshan and Phantom Strike allowed her to quickly target down the backline during fights which also reset her cooldowns and let her go again. After the supports were taken care of, the rest of her opponents crumbled easily. That is, as long as Phantom Assassin managed to go undetected. Often she would find herself on the receiving end of the Sables as the most powerful heroes of the tournament, Chaos Knight, Spirit Breaker and Dazzle, all had easy ways of locking her down. Silver Edge also became the most popular it had ever been, which certainly made everything even more difficult. Phantom Assassin saw quite a bit of play during the group stage, but as she wasn't putting up good results, she vanished from the tournament. In a twisted way, we just saw her best performance since TI6, as she finally wasn't outright bad and instead just outclassed by better characters. Nonetheless, Phantom Assassin saw little success at the International 2023, being picked in 12 games with a 41% win rate. If I may make a controversial statement here, I wish she hadn't been nerfed in 7.34D. I think it would have been interesting to see what a TI with a good Phantom Assassin would have looked like. In particular, I believe she could have been a powerful deterrent to Chaos Knight, as she had a good matchup against him. But because of the nerfs, Chaos Knight was just so much better than her across the board that it didn't really matter. Phantom Assassin is the first hero that we have covered that I would simply describe as bad. She was bad during the early years of Dota 2 as her abilities were too basic even for that era. She was bad during the golden age as she got neglected while the rest of the game went through years of power creep. And she is bad today as modern Dota's timing based gameplay is too restrictive for her to handle. Throughout Dota history, Phantom Assassin has been unimpressive at best and at worst self-sabotage. Only one team ever managed to make Phantom Assassin work for them, MVP Phoenix at the International 2016. They reinterpreted her from a carry into an aggressive early ganker and performed incredibly well doing so. But even here, I can imagine an alternative reality where QO didn't land some of the critical strikes he did and then we wouldn't be talking about MVP's success right now. After that brief moment in the spotlight, it took Phantom Assassin nearly 7 years to finally get the buzz she needed to become relevant in the competitive scene. But as soon as she did, the outrage that followed was overwhelming. The community hated playing against a Phantom Assassin that was actually good. And this wasn't just true for the pub scene. With only a week remaining before the International 12, 
she was nerfed into irrelevance yet again. I think the biggest problem with PA was her frustrating design. She was meant to be a hidden assassin that landed flashy critical strikes, but that was too unreliable. And so the only way Valve could make this idea work was by making her uninteractable and guaranteeing her ultimate. They succeeded at her vision design, but sometimes the vision just isn't very fun to play against, and so they had to undo what made her function. Phantom Assassin is one of the worst Dota heroes of all time, and unfortunately I don't see that changing anytime soon. Thank you very much for watching the story of Phantom Assassin. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. We would definitely appreciate that. And of course, as always, I hope you guys are excited for what's coming next, which is going to be Alchemist, one of the kings of money. Now, setting that aside really quick, we're currently considering starting another YouTube channel called, uh, well, Actually, I'm not sure about the name yet, but it's gonna be Stories of League of Legends. Basically, Stories of Dota, but about League of Legends and worlds instead of the international. Now, for that to be a possibility, we need a team. Because me and Toski were working on Stories of Dota, we can't also do another thing, it's just we don't have the time for it, right? So, if you think you could be part of that team, we're looking for an editor and we're looking for a writer slash researcher. When I say writer slash researcher, I mean a single person. Um, then please feel free to contact us. Follow me for hire at gmail.com. This down in the description, you can find it there. Um, please make sure you include a portfolio and or a CV. I don't particularly care if you have any education, but I do care that I see what work you have done before. That's something that matters. So yeah, uh, anyway, if you're interested in that, let me know. Uh, we have no idea when we would start this channel. This is really going to be a matter of finding a team. And if we find a team, then we do it. And if we can't find a team, then I guess we don't. Uh, but hey, we'll see how it works out. Anyway, that's it for today. And I'll see you guys next time.